And from there, I want to tell you more about the details. So Mark Hurst, if you would come up here and join me and take us on. Mark is the director of the Open Science Laboratory part of it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, good evening, everyone at home. Um, I'm going to kick off tonight's proceedings by um, starting about uh, the centre of uh, the picture Nick just showed, which was the, the Open Science Laboratory. Um, this is an online portal that's become rather a mainstay in our science teaching um, over, over the last few years. Um, it, and it's added to that depth and to the blended learning that our students have been used to. Um, it has about 100 different types of activities in it. Um, and in fact, it's not just there for OU students, it's open to, to, to the public as well. 48 of these activities are open to the general public to use, to schools, to teachers. It consists of a range of different types of experimental activities that allow students to go in and collect data, write reports, make experimental choices, make observations. Some of these are remote. A lot of them are through what we call interactive screen experiments. So these evolved from the types of experiments that were originally mailed out on DVDs and CDs to students that they would do at home on their own uh, computers. These are now done uh, through um, little apps that run through the Open Science Lab. And to add to that, to allow our students to analyse and prepare data for their reports, we provide the whole series of data analysis tools. I mean, it's very difficult in a few minutes to give you a flavour. Uh, put an Open Science Lab into Google if you've never been there, register and you can, you can take a look yourself. I can only explain a few things. I'm going to give you a very brief flavour of, of the type of, of activities our students do in the, in, in the Open Science Lab because I want to actually then show you where we're going next in terms of actually integrating real live uh, um, analytical instruments. Just at the bottom is a reminder that to show how mainstream the Open Science Lab has becoming our teaching, that this year we have about 50,000 student hours of activity using the Open Science Labs in, in the, the various areas of science curriculum. So if you go to the Open Science Lab, it looks like a series of tiles or apps I've just picked out six um, as examples. One of the very first ones that was developed originally as a, as a mail-out tool was a, a digital microscope. This has proved incredibly valuable for teaching all aspects of geosciences, of environmental sciences, and in my field, in biology particularly. It's an incredibly valuable tool because you can put authentic uh, images there, whole scans of slides, and allow students to actually choose how they collect their data, what they present, how they score, how they record it. So it's a great tool for teaching practical science. We have analytical instruments. For example, the DNA Quantitation Lab is, a, is effectively a, a, an online spectrophotometer uh, programmed with a whole range of spectrophotometric data for nucleic acids which again allows students to go in, it allows them to make mistakes. They can put in the wrong parameters and actually make errors. And so those types of authentic data actually lend a, a, an element of real practical exploration for students. We also have another example here used by our level one students called a spirometer, which where students, it's actually based upon a data set based upon human epidemiology studies. Again, it allows students to propose hypotheses, go in and collect data that's based upon real uh, human physiology data sets. So these are just six of the types of apps that sit in the Open Science Lab. Some of them also have much more immersive environments, making use of Unity programming, where exploring a space is important, like field trips, or walking around a laboratory to find a pH meter or some solutions to do some, to do some laboratory chemistry. But it's not all about students collecting data. From our labs, it's also about people out there doing citizen science, actually putting data into apps, uh, the first of which was the iSpot, where people put in biological data. Many hundreds of thousands of, of data sets have been collected. Our students also use this in various modules. And Treezilla, uh, which is a record of uh, character trees uh, around the world. So it's not just about our students going in there and carrying out science. It's about a wider outreach to the general public engaging them, bringing into uh, our, our OU resources into the Open Science Lab to carry out science. So that's a very, very quick trip around what the Open Science Lab represents. Um, as Nick's just shown you, those are like peering through the window of a laboratory. We're, we're, we've got students, we, we've allowed them in to have a little peek, but actually now what we're going to do is actually try and open the door and ask them actually through. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of 
real live remote analytical instruments that will be appearing in the Open Science Lab in the next few years. So for example, these are online optical microscopes. So whereas a digital microscope presents a static image, which is incredibly useful for teaching the basics of microscopy and exploration and data collection, an optical microscope allows you to move things around. It allows you to look at things that are wiggling around and moving around, like worms in genetic experiments. So it takes that experience to a, to a new level of interaction and authenticity. There's a whole range of desktop instrumentation, um, for example, to do genetic analysis with quantitative, quantitative polymerase chain reaction, or a, an online real-time access version of the DNA quantitation instrument. One of the great advantages as an instructor that these give me is that whereas a piece of uh, a programmed application is sat there, it's very difficult for me to update it. I can go with one of these remote instruments and change a sample overnight. I can be reactive to my students, which means it's a more robust teaching tool. So I can use these instruments much more interactively as a teacher. So for me and my colleagues, it's a very valuable uh, tool I can use. There are also much more larger instruments, for example, a large flow chemistry system and this monster, this gas chromatography mass spectra, uh, spectrometry system. But I'm going to give you a very quick view of what life's like with an electron microscope. And if I can remember how to use, um, this is an example of a live view of what the uh, electron microscope. Some of you here in the hall may have actually been using this outside. And uh, when I was introduced, I was meant to be talking about materials. Well, this is actually, um, I, I, I'd ask you to guess, it's a biomaterial. And one thing I always find about um, these types of plasma, a quick explanation, this is a live view of an electron microscope that sat about 200 meters behind me in one of the old BBC studios through about five walls this way. This is a live view of the inside of, of that instrument. And these are web-based instruments that are not just remote desktops. So this is not remote desktoping to the interface that controls the microscope. We have a fantastic team of programmers who've designed web interfaces, which means they work across platforms. They can work on phones, they can work on tablets, they can work anywhere in the world. Nick's famous for having uh, tweeted a photo from 30,000 feet somewhere over Central Asia. Uh, we've also been testing our eye access, uh, the instruments from, from Death Valley last summer, just to show you can actually do it. So um, this is a very close-up view. If I scroll down slightly, you can see the scale bar right at the bottom, a 10 micrometer scale bar for those that the front can actually see it. This looks like some horrendous uh, uh, material, but I'm actually now going to zoom out just to show this is a live image. As a biologist, I find nothing excites a crowd more than something that's a creepy crawly. This is actually the front end of a rice weevil. Uh, probably don't encounter them much these days, but um, if you can face to face with it um, at that, that power, you'd probably be quite scared. So uh, the interface that's been designed for, uh, in this case, uh, relatively simple control. We can change focus, we can and collect levels, and more importantly, if I capture a, an image, that image is stored on my computer and it can be used in student reports. So as, as, as an, an opportunity to, prevent, to present students with even a simple opportunity to see something that excites them, like a creepy crawly up close, uh, is, is an absolutely fantastic opportunity. Of course, there are far more uh, scientific uh, and important opportunities. So that's a very a quick trip around the scanning electron microscope. It's sat outside in the mezzanine, outside for those people here who'd like to have a go. And we've got uh, several of my colleagues will give you a guided tour of lots of other different uh, creepy crawlies and things. So where, where do we see these being used? Um, tonight is also about the space that, uh, science and technology masters that's about to start. The analytical instruments I've been talking about will find their first home in the, the, the curriculum um, in, in, in this module. For example, uh, students will be using the light microscope and the scanning electron microscope to look at things like micrometeorite damage on, on the surface of satellites and things like that. And I think you can also have a look at the Mars rover and the satellites down outside. So I'm going to sum up now. Um, uh, it's always been mentioned, mailing out kits was what the OU started with. Here's a, a view of them assembling a, a science kit with a little microscope being used in the background. But it used to be that the only way we could show our students complicated, large and expensive analytical instruments, for example, a transmission electron microscope shown here, was on broadcast TV or through video instruments. Now we can do that. We can open that door. The students can come in and actually sit in front and operate real instruments. 
So the next few years, these will be being integrated into the Open Science Lab and will find their way into various aspects of our curriculum. Thank you.